Welcome painters to our weekly painting prompt. This week's prompt is entitled Where I Dream of Going. This is going to be a fun opportunity for you to flip through your old photos, archives of family photos, your personal photos. It could be a vacation you took last summer or an exciting trip abroad. This is a place that has some kind of memory or meaning or something special that you hold dear in connection to it. And for this particular painting, we're gonna be looking at more of a landscape or something that incorporates a little bit of architecture, uh, possibly a combination of the two leaving out figures for this particular prompt will help us focus on the elements of painting that we can achieve in landscape and uh, to explore painting techniques that can be a little freer without having to focus so much on anatomy at this point. With every painting, uh, I like to accompany my kind of my journey on what that painting might be with a drawing or two. Uh, and this is certainly a preliminary action to starting your painting, especially when you've chosen your subject. Uh, so you see here where I dream of going is a, a vacation spot that my family frequented growing up, probably for the first 20 years of my life. Uh, it's a spot in Michigan on Long Lake and it's a really special place where we would go for a number of weeks and really just reminds me of play and exploration and quiet and also the complete opposite the loud family celebration of being together this is a neat little spot here this is the boat launch the little boat house and where you could just grab canoes or a rowboat and get into the lake, go fishing early in the morning or in the evening, go for a ride or sit on this little swing you sit here. So there's just so much for me in this small, tiny little composition that brings back memory and also fills me with a feeling of joy and family. And so as an artist, I like to capture and create paintings that kind of fill, can fill the viewer with a story or a narrative uh, that also can just share a little piece of, you know, my travels uh, and my legacy here. So I've chosen this photograph. Uh, it's probably from 1982, and I'm just guessing. <laughs> it was a film photograph, so it's been scanned. So there's a little bit of distortion in the in the in the color. It's it actually looks like one of those filters you might put on one of your photos. And I think you used to be able to put a filter that was 1970s <laughs> onto your onto your photo. But this is the real deal. So this is a neat kind of simplified color play. Lots of cool colors uh, as you look at the lake and the, the tree line and the greens in the foreground. So we'll be going into color here in a moment. But I wanna show you my drawing and why this was important for me to do. There's a little bit of architecture here in the boathouse. And in order to get the boathouse to really feel three-dimensional and to sit within this plane, within these different fields, I had to first determine where my horizon line was. And so the horizon line is here and this is the tree line across. And from there, I really gauged where everything else kind of fell into place. I determined where halfway through the composition was. And then I placed this pole here, this light pole, which really helped me determine, you know, where everything else is in relationship to not only center, but now off center and the horizon line. So I created a point of access within the drawing that I could then build everything from. I actually had to extend my drawing a little bit because it was hard to fit all of these elements 
into this small sketch. So doing this is kind of like doing your homework or a little bit of a study before you get to the canvas. And really I spent almost 40 minutes working this out and I'm so glad I did because it really allowed for the drawing on the canvas to go a lot smoother and a lot faster. I didn't have to figure things out there. I figured them out here. So a couple things that I did that are important is figuring out the perspective in which this little boathouse is sitting in this picture plane. So I took my pencil to the photograph and I just made a little visual line as to where the bottom and the edge of the roof kind of meet. And you can kind of see I'm creating a little access point here and that's called a vantage point. So I actually made a little mark on my paper and I used my ruler to create the lines to go to that vantage point. All, all three of these lines, the roof, the roof edge and the bottom of the, of the boathouse. In one of the quick tip videos, I will be diving into perspective a little bit more. So we'll talk about that. Notice the, 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 where the swing is in relation to the canoes, making sure to get a little bit of the docks in over here as well. So really most of the content and composition is here in this central area. I actually moved the horizon line up. In the photograph, it was about halfway. And so I wanted to create that element of almost within the rule of thirds, but not quite. I wanted to move the foreground up a little bit just to give a little bit more information into this area where there is quite, where there are quite a few objects. Just showing you the supplies that I'll be using. So this here is my palette knife. These are the three brushes that I'll be probably primarily using. So this is a one inch angle brush. I love these angle brushes because I can achieve a nice flat edge, but I can also get a really nice fine line. This is gonna be really helpful when drawing in or painting in rather this horizon line and some of the planes on the boathouse, even, even getting in some of the details on the canoes, maybe some of these grasses. And then I have the same version of that, but just a little bit smaller. Uh, this is a three quarter inch angle brush. So the same kind of techniques can be done with that. And my liner brush here is used typically towards the end. And you can see here that the bristles are as long as the angle brush, but extremely narrow. Uh, and with the right consistency of paint, I'll be able to get very fine lines for some of the details in the swing, maybe in the boat, maybe in some of the grasses, uh, certainly this pole here. And so that'll be kind of towards the end as I add in some of those finishing touches. I did this sketch with a, a pencil that I remember from middle school. Actually, these are so great. <laughs> you feel like you never run out of lead. And then I, I drew out onto the canvas my design with a watercolor pencil. And you'll see when I'm drawing out the design that I'm also using this ruler to help with the same principles of perspective and proportion and getting in a nice straight horizon line uh, and then I'm also using the brush to kind of clean up some of the, the marks that I'm making that might be a little distracting. So the watercolor pencil is really great because it's very forgiving on the canvas because you can almost uh, erase the, the drawing as you go if you need to. So in thinking about your steps for this project, the first step is gonna be to choose a reference. You know, choose something that is uh, not too overly complicated, uh, meaning it has a focal point, a nice element in it uh, that you can bring the viewer's eye to, and it's not going to be too distracting or overwhelming for you to create. Something that has a foreground, meaning an area closest to the viewer, a middle ground, which would be considered kind of the lake here, and then the background, which will be the tree line in the sky. So this is three levels in your picture plane. 
And using the right color and value, we can create a vast amount of depth um, showing our viewer you know, far into this two-dimensional space, creating a three-dimensional illusion. After you've selected your photograph, feel free to do some minor editing, making sure that your horizon line is straight in the photograph. Maybe you wanna boost up the colors a little bit, um, adding some saturation, uh, perhaps boosting up the contrast a little bit, um, just adding a little bit more depth to the highlight and the shadow. And then certainly cropping the photo. If there's elements that you want to eliminate along the edge, or if you want to zoom in on a portion of the photograph. Sometimes when we take a picture, we include a lot of information in that photo. And by just cropping a little bit, we can create a whole new composition uh, from that photo that is a little more simplified. So consider doing that to kind of help eliminate a lot of the detail. Going back to our basic color wheel and the two sets of primary colors that I use and demonstrate my paintings with, uh, just to give you a little refresher here, we have our warm primary color wheel and our cool primary color wheel. And so the reds here, the red here in the warm and the red here in the cool, the difference is, is that this red leans a little bit hotter, a little bit warmer, a little bit more towards a really rich red. Whereas this magenta or quinacridone magenta leans a little bit more towards the blue spectrum of the color wheel, making it cooler. And so that happens with the yellow and the green uh, and the violet, these secondary colors that are made. Uh, they, they tend to lean and move towards the cooler end of the color wheel, while these pigments here lean towards the warmer side of the color wheel. Uh, I will also be doing a more in-depth quick tip video on color theory, so watch out for that. So for this particular painting, I did a couple studies to find out which of the cool and warm sets I would be using for this particular reference. So I determined that I will be using a cerulean blue, which is our cool blue. I'll be using a warm yellow, which is the cadmium yellow medium, and then a cool red for uh, mixing. Uh, we will be kind of combining these three to make all the colors that you see in the reference here. So I wanted to walk you through some color mixing for this particular reference, uh, just to give you an idea of how much of each color you'll need to make these different, these different pigments. So I'm gonna start with the background, which is gonna be our sky, and then our, our middle ground, which will be the lake and the tree line. And then we'll move into some of the greens. Uh, and notice in the corner here, uh, the ochres and almost red browns that you see. And so I'm gonna show you how to make those earth tones with these three pigments as well. And so you might be asking, well, why didn't I choose a cool yellow um, just to stick within that trifecta of cool primaries. And really this medium cadmium is such a rich yellow that I really wanted my greens to feel very heavy and vibrant uh, and, and warm. And so I wanted these greens in the foreground to really come forward. And so we know that about our warm colors that they tend to come forward in the painting. Whereas our cool colors like our, our blue here and our magenta are going to recede really beautifully in the painting. So these two cool pigments will be used quite a bit for the background and middle ground. And then I'll be dominating with the medium cadmium in the foreground for that rich warm green that we really want. 
And again, I did a few studies, meaning I just made some teeny tiny little mixtures of these colors. I tried a ultramarine blue, I tried the warm red, and it just didn't quite hit home for me. Uh, and so it's really a matter of preference uh, and your visual preference as to which colors you choose. There's not a real science behind this. Uh, we can all kind of perceive color a little bit differently. So your selection will be correct. <laughs> I'm going to start by mixing our sky color, which is mostly going to be um, white with a little bit of our cerulean blue. So I'm just going to grab a nice batch of the, the white here. And I'm using my palette knife. I'm not using a brush. And I'm setting myself up with all the colors that I'll need so that I can really jam on this painting. So I've got a nice um, mixture here of it's a tint when you add white so it's a very tinted shade of the cerulean blue but I want to I want to um, spice this color up a little bit I'm just gonna grab a little nick of the magenta and um, toss that into my blend here and that's just going to make it a little bit more violet or purple as you can see and just take it a little further away from just that perfect tint of cerulean and white. So I'm really liking this color um, and what's going to happen is that I will add white uh, on the canvas and we'll do some wet blending right on the canvas um, as this color changes to where it comes to meet the tree line. So as we move into that tree line color I'll just pull some of this extra cerulean from over here and start a new little pile. This The tree line also has the magenta so we're immediately changing this cerulean into um, a more of a violet color. Uh, we're adding a cool red. So we're creating a very nice cool shade of violet. It's got some white already mixed in it. Uh, but this is these are trees. And even though this is kind of a faded photograph, I do see a little, a little hint of green back there. So I'm going to add a little bit of our rich cadmium. and we keep tweaking. So this to me feels a little bit too green still. I'm gonna go back and add a little bit more of the cerulean, push that back towards the blue end, the cool blue end. And you can take a little bit of the color that you're mixing onto your palette knife and hold it up next to your reference. This is super helpful. Uh, keeping in mind that acrylic dries a little bit darker than what you see on your palette. So if you're going for exact, exact, or if you're trying to remake a color, you should always keep that in the back of your head, that your, your, the dried pigment will be a little bit darker. So this almost looks a little bit blue-green, which is wonderful because that's that kind of bleached photo effect that we're going for. So this is going to be a great starter color for our tree line. You can kind of see a couple different values in the tree line. So what I'm going to do is just pull a little bit off which we um, already determined is a great color for us. And we're gonna I'm gonna grab a little bit more of the magenta and just tweak that a little bit, adding a little bit more of the cerulean. So I'm really just taking a, a, a bit more of each of the pigments, including the, the cadmium yellow. I'm gonna grab a little bit more of the magenta. Notice the tiny amounts of paint that I'm grabbing. Um, but that doesn't mean I've started with a tiny amount of paint. I've got quite a bit to work with here on my palette paper. I've got a nice big work surface to mix on. Uh, I'm spending some time just kind of getting the colors right. And so now I have a darker value of a similar color line. So we've got almost like a highlight and a shadow. So we've got two colors here working for us that will be our background tree line. So as we move forward into the painting, I'm gonna mix our greens. Uh, and so the selection of this cadmium yellow was really so that this green would pop forward so it would feel really rich and vibrant. Uh, this is another thing I want you to see. Notice the pool of yellow that I'm, that I'm starting here and the very small amount of blue that I'm working with. Whenever making a green, I always start with my yellow hue first and I slowly mix in the greens. 
So a cool blue and a warm yellow makes a really beautiful, rich grass spring green, and I'm just loving that already. Because this is a larger part of our painting, I wanna make sure that I have enough to go with here. So I'm gonna grab even more of the cadmium and another little touch of the, the cerulean and get that nicely mixed. And this is where the palette knife is so handy. If you were using your brush, all of this pigment would be stuck in your brush. And then you'd have to put it somewhere. So maybe you're creating an abstract painting on the side. It's always fun. So I've got a nice, beautiful, bright green for kind of where the water meets the green by the swing. And now I want to kind of pull some of this off because the green doesn't stay this color throughout the painting. It actually gets a little bit more yellow and it gets a little bit lighter, meaning we want to tint it a little bit. So we're gonna add a little white to this batch over here. Just gonna scoop a little, mix that in slowly. And now this could even be a little bit lighter. This to me resembles the green around the boathouse, uh, around those tall grasses, and even kind of creeping around where the canoes are sitting. So let's look down towards the bottom right of the reference and we're looking at some of those earth tones. I see a yellow ochre, almost um, like a burnt umber. Uh, so let's make those earth tones with these three primaries and see what we get. Now you can certainly buy a yellow ochre, you can buy burnt sienna, um, you can buy burnt umber. Uh, I, I often just like the challenge of working with a very simple um, color starter palette. So let's go ahead with our ochre. Um, it's definitely dominant yellow. I'm going to clean off my palette knife. I've got this great tool here. It's called a rag. I am always painting with the rag. It used to be my clothes, um, but now the rag has saved some outfits. So we're going to start with a nice batch of our cad yellow. And I'm going to fold in, starting with a little bit of the magenta, and then I'm gonna grab just a little dot of our cerulean. So our earth tones have all three primaries. And see, you can see right there, right away. Notice how dominant that cerulean is the second we put it in the yellow. I mean, I almost just needed a portion of that speck of of cerulean. So what we're going to have to do now is kind of backtrack. So we're going to even add more of our war of our cool red. So this is kind of taking us into um, a little bit of like a like an earthy sap green or army green as we may know it. Uh, this is a great color right here. And this color actually is pretty important and I do see that happening in our painting. So why don't we, let's leave some of it. We'll grab, a, pull off a little bit and we'll keep working on our ochre. That's the nice thing about doing the sketch ahead of time as well. You're not just focused on the lines and the proportion of things or the composition or how to lay things out, but you really start looking at the color. Uh, and this is where you can start to kind of plot out what you might need to mix and make some of these, the colors that you're seeing in your reference. So the, the sketch is important on so many different levels for just getting your head in the game. You know, what am I working on here? What, what is it that I, I want to highlight in this painting or in this picture? What colors do I want to exaggerate or um, make even bolder? So I'm working towards this ochre, and I'm just slowly adding a little bit more of the, the magenta. I've not added any more of the cerulean at this point. We kind of started over here and it got a little wild. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, kind of stick in this area. I'm kind of, I'm really liking this right now. So we've got our, our homemade ochre 
which is a little green leaning or blue leaning, which you could say it's a very cool yellow ochre. Now here's the here's the ochre right out of the out of the tube. And I, this is very much a warm ochre. So this to me looks almost orange compared to what we just mixed. But this one is working for me because this entire painting or this entire photograph has feels like it has a cool filter just tossed over the whole thing. So for the this far right corner and any of the shadows, let's think about how we can make a really nice dark value out of these three primary colors. So for that, I'm gonna start with our cerulean. This is um, one of the times where you really get to just um, add quite a bit of blue to your mixture and almost the same amount of the magenta. So we're really going for um, an, enough pigment that we can use this across the whole painting. So right now this is a very cool violet. So it's blue leaning. The blue is certainly more dominant than the magenta at this point. Uh, we're gonna keep adding magenta. And you can see just by adding these two pigments together, we've already got the darkest value on our palette. Uh, if this feels a little too purple, which it does to me, uh, the trick here is to add our friend cadmium yellow. I'm actually gonna start with a small amount. So just like we made the ochre when we used all three primaries, this one, this is a really great mixture using all three primaries, but instead of the cadmium yellow dominating, we've got the magenta and the cerulean dominating. So I'm gonna grab another batch of that. And we wanna be careful not to make green. Uh, so that's where your, your kind of threshold is. Right now we've got a nice, what I like to call kind of like a muddy violet. And this is gonna look really great with um, all the other pigments that we've made. So let's hold black up next to this and just get a sense of how dark this really is. So here's black, Mars black, right out of a tube. And it certainly is quite a bit darker on the value scale, but we're creating our own value scale within this painting. So we'll be able to really emphasize the shadow using this, especially when it's next to these bright, popping greens and ochres and sky colors that we've made. So we'll be able to, that'll be able to pass as our shadow color. So the final pigments to mix here are, are, are the boathouse. It's just the boathouse white. Because uh, we can actually use uh, combinations of what we already have on our palette for the shadow part of the boathouse. Uh, and certainly the canoes are gonna be, are gonna be a lot of this, uh, of our darker value. And then um, over by the docks, that's where we'll see a darker value again. And then in our tree at the, above the boathouse, um, we'll be able to kind of on the fly make a green, uh, especially if we restock our cad yellow here. So for, to make our boathouse, we want some un, uncontaminated white. <laughs> so we gotta go back to the, go back to the source here. And I'll just plop that down over here so it's a little closer to the mixture needed. Uh, and so for this boathouse white, just wanna grab a little bit of the cad yellow and mix that in there. Now for thinning your paint while you're painting, you can use a couple different things. Uh, water is certainly number one. Uh, water does not bind with the acrylic as well as an acrylic medium would. So if you're thinning your paint down uh, and you still want it to have uh, some texture or viscosity or just the ability to spread without being very uh, drippy, uh, I recommend a matte medium. And so the difference between matte and gloss is just the sheen. 
Uh, this is coming from like a bulk container, so it's just a small container for me to use. Uh, but the matte medium I'll use in this painting, it's not gonna change the sheen of the paint, but it's gonna allow the paint to spread really nicely, especially in the sky. It's going to open the drying time of the paint just a little bit so that I can do blending for a little bit longer. And so we've, now we have this really nice kind of yellow cream color that we can add white into for the boathouse uh, and use anywhere else as a light value, um, maybe on the docks uh, or in that bottom right corner where you see sort of the, the burnt grasses. So here we have our starter palette um, from, again, our three primary colors, the warm yellow and the cool cerulean and the cool magenta. Uh, and really we've got a great um, a setup here for a successful painting. All right, that's great. So you were able to see uh, me draw out the drawing. And just to reiterate, you know, I used a vantage point here uh, and the help of the ruler for sure. Uh, so that's how I was able to get the boathouse in, which is the only piece of architecture um, in, the, in the drawing. So if you notice, I was able to get to the bottom of the boathouse, the edge of the roof line, and the top of the roof line all within the same perspective plane using this vantage point. Uh, and the, the way that I found that vantage point was just by putting up a ruler or a pencil uh, to, my, to my reference and kind of determining after sort of moving that pencil around where all of those points connected. Uh, sometimes your vantage point can be off the canvas, but uh, it just so happened that it was right here. Uh, so this is really important. These little tweaks in perspective can really make or break your painting in terms of realism, if that's what you're going for. So we've got our horizon line. I moved it up a little, about a half an inch from center. I wanted to just have it off-centered a little bit. Uh, Dead center might not have been horrible, but I certainly wanted to add a little bit more interest to the bottom here and a little bit more room for all of the information that is mostly in the bottom. So for this painting, I'm going to start with the background. So we'll be working in the sky. I'll be building in the tree line. I'll kind of rough in the boathouse and then we'll build the greens and then the canoe uh, and things and, and some of the dark values in the tree will come in last. You can see here that I've toned the ground of the canvas. So I started with a um, out of the tube yellow ochre and used very little pigment and quite a bit of water actually. Uh, so you could use matte medium or water. Uh, I have read and heard that the matte medium is better because it binds with the acrylic poly polymer and actually binds with the canvas a lot better than water. Uh, but for these small works, I, I've had great success with using washes. Um, so it's, it's up to you. 
So we've got a light ochre background and you know this really just helps kind of eliminate the brightness of the white canvas. You're not you're going to see some of this ochre pop through at the end uh, but mostly it's there to enhance the color that I put down first. Okay, so we've got our palette is ready to go. We couldn't be more ready uh, to get started. I'm gonna open up the medium here so that can be handy. I've got my rag and my water bucket nearby. Everything is right where I need it. So I always start by just kind of dropping my brush in a little bit of water and then drying it off on my rag just sort of uh, helps ignite the bristles a little bit. Maybe they've been sitting a while. Maybe there's a little paint that wasn't cleaned out and it kind of just helps get them flowing again. So starting with our background, we mix this really beautiful um, kind of tinted uh, cerulean blue. We added a little bit of the magenta. I just grabbed some white. Notice how um, really kind of uh, liquefied that paint has become. It's no longer that thick paint and this is going to ensure that I'm really able to get a nice blend right on the canvas. So we're going to be doing a wet blend uh, right on the canvas. Nice and loaded up brush back and forth. You can see how I'm really getting that uh, loaded there. So I'm going to come in and kind of sneak underneath the stretcher there. Because this is so thin you can see some of that ochre popping through and I actually don't mind that right now. So this is um, maybe one of a couple layers that I'll do. So I'm thinking about my tree here and it's okay to paint over edges and you can see that some of that watercolor pencil is just um, blending right into our color. If it's too washy for you, just go back into the pigment. Notice that big shift, less water, means more intentional pigment. It could also be a little harder to spread. So you want to make sure you have enough paint mixed and ready to go. Uh, and so I'm really getting in here with this color. I'm just going to paint right over that light pole. We know where it is. Uh, it might actually just continue to show through ever so slightly. Uh, so in the reference, and I'm just smoothing this out, I'm kind of eliminating the brush strokes. I want the sky to be really soft. There are no clouds. Kind of adds to the mood, you know, that like moment in time, that almost gray, <laughs> gray day. But this, this, this particular time of day, to me it looks like maybe around six o'clock or maybe six in the morning. I gotta think about where the sun is actually rising might be a morning. I'm grabbing some white here and this is my kind of dirty white. <laughs> There's a little bit of green. That's okay. I'm making sure that I'm changing the value on my brush. So notice I've grabbed a little white. I've moved off to the side. I found a different spot on my palette and now I'm going back and forth really mixing, almost changing the pigment entirely on my brush. And so while I have this really short window uh, to blend or wet blend back into this sky color, I want to make sure that I'm mo moving a little fast. We can always go back in and do this exact same technique on the sky once it's dry. Uh, in one of my quick tips videos, you'll get to see uh, different brush blending techniques and wet into wet blending is one of them. It's actually a great way to underpaint your painting is to um, keep the paint a little bit uh, a little bit more open by adding the medium. Let's grab a little bit of our matte medium instead and let's see how that works. So we want to bring this light white all the way down to our tree line. And I'm making a different kind of mark here. Notice I'm going kind of, um, I'm going vertically. <laughs> and now I can just take a quick horizontal swipe back and forth. So already this top area is drying and it is what we call tacky. You do not want to go back into that at this point. It's kind of a hands-off sort of moment for up there. So if there's changes you want to make in the sky and you're five minutes into your painting, I would just wait because I'm really happy with this fade. I may decide not to go back into the sky, but let's see. We always have that option. And remember that acrylic loves 
to be layered. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I'm getting this color across despite the little boathouse here. So we've got our tree line, which is next up, and I'm using my rag to get rid of the pigment on the brush. I did not go into the water. I just used the rag on the side, kind of blotting off the color, and now I'm gonna go into the tree line color that we made. So I've got a pretty dry brush right now. I didn't go into the water or the medium, and I'm gonna do the same thing um, for loading up my brush. I'm not doing a really heavy load of paint. I'm just doing kind of the, the front tip of it and loading it back and forth is always the trick, just taking a little time. Uh, and now we're gonna go in with our lighter value for the background. And it's not a straight line across like I drew, but that was just my guide. You know, there's little tufts of trees here and there. And sometimes the color can surprise you when you put it on the canvas, like right now for me. This is looking a lot more blue than I feel like when I was mixing it. Uh, and that's okay. I, I do think I'm going to tweak it a little bit, but for now, let's just get this color on here. We'll get it underpainted. I'm kind of sneaking around the boathouse a little bit. You don't have to be too careful about objects in the, in the foreground or in front of what you're working on. This is exactly why we work background to foreground, because it's okay to paint over a little bit of what is in the foreground. It's actually better if you do that, because then you don't leave a gap. So we kind of just painted over the top of our, of our little swing, <laughs> um, and we're, we're preserving the boathouse pretty well here. So we've got a nice kind of roughed up tree line, you know, a little activity back there. Uh, again, not using water, but I am gonna go into that darker blend that I made here. And that was just adding a little bit more violet and a little bit of yellow. Uh, and there is, there is a nice shadow happening sort of where the trees meet the water. Uh, instead of using the full flat of the brush, I'm actually now just using the tip of the brush. So I'm making a totally different kind of mark than before. And I'm just kind of dotting along the edge here, um, imagining what you know clusters of trees far, far off in the distance could look like. We're working with two values. I started with the lighter one and now I'm coming in with the shadow and keeping in mind that the, the colors will dry a little bit darker. So I'm just getting that, getting that shadow in. Uh, and now, you know, after looking at my reference and getting these two values down, um, I wanna go in and make one that's a little brighter. So I'm not gonna use my palette knife, but I am gonna grab a little bit of white I'm going to put it right here where I was working with that first tree line color. And I just tinted it just a little bit. And now I've got the brush loaded up really nice. And again, using the tip of the brush, I'm seeing that the sun is kind of hitting, we're actually gonna add a little bit of green here. I'm gonna snag a little bit of this bright green. So this is where you get to continually observe your reference uh, and make little adjustments. So I want my highlight to just give us a little suggestion of the greens on the top of the tree line here. Um, very just slowly kind of adding in little marks, little dots. And this is just a very sweet part of the painting. It's, it's, in, that, it's in that middle sort of spot in the picture plane. Uh, it's not gonna be our focal point but it certainly is gonna give depth to the viewer as they look into the horizon line. It's a very important piece. And I'm noticing that it just kinda of trails off and gets darker further to the right and that the highlight on the tree line is mostly to the far left here, uh, to the left and right of the boathouse. So this will be a neat area to come back to if we need, if we need it. Maybe a couple little points. So this is where I clean my brush. And we didn't mix a color for the water, but I'm actually just going to use the sky color without adding any white. So I'm grabbing a nice amount of that, again, turning the brush back and forth to get it loaded up. So this is a clean brush, same brush, clean brush, water, then rag, then paint. 
Uh, and this is where we get an opportunity to clean up our horizon line or the edge here. Uh, we want this to be really, really clear. So I'm using the long end of my brush and I'm just gonna make, so notice also too, I'm using my pinky finger as a, almost like a little peg leg. It's adding a little bit of support to my line. Uh, I've had students ask, how do I make a straight line? Well, slowly and with practice and patience. And also cheating by using a little peg leg. Now you've probably seen sign painters uh, or some artists use what they call an awl. And that's like a tool that can actually allow your arm to rest. So you could almost use your, your, your second arm, <laughs> the arm you're not painting with. I, 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 um, as, a, as a support as well. So I'll, I'll do that again. So I'm leaning my hand on my arm and I, it's really helping steady my hand. And notice this, the really lovely edge that you know, this angle brush is giving us. Now we don't wanna be too careful about the, the swing. So I'm, kind of, I'm lightly painting over it I'm painting down over where those grasses would be. Uh, and this is probably a spot in the painting where I'll want to add another layer, just so it feels a little more opaque, so that the sky maybe can be a little bit brighter. And, you know, within that, that window, while this is still drying, we can kind of you know, work the paint. Working the paint. Uh, if you want to come back with a second coat, you're going to want to wait to do that. Just cleaning off the brush, going back into my dark blue, going to clean up this line. this kind of tree line edge. I'm just being very delicate, very careful. Just taking my time, just really enjoying what I'm doing. And I think this is where I really fall in love with painting, is in these kind of quiet moments of observing and looking and figuring and replicating. And what a more special thing than to be replicating something that is so personal to me and my story. And so many artists use their, their talents, their love of creating to express themselves uh, in a range of ways. So we've got a nice kind of beginning to our painting here. And we'll move into this middle ground uh, with the green grasses. Grabbing this really beautiful bright green, kind of just hitting that underneath. Any pigment that is yellow dominant, orange, various greens, is gonna be very transparent. And so that's where the underpainting is really, really nice and helpful because it, it just gives us kind of a, a starting point before the pigment goes down. If we didn't have this ochre underneath, the green would look really, really bright uh, and a little weak. But now with that ochre underneath, it just it feels a lot more intentional. So we've got a few different greens mixed uh, that we can be kind of wet blending right on the canvas. I'm just gonna bring this color across. Always make sure your reference is close by, whether it's printed and kind of taped up, um, you know, next to your easel, or in my case here, I'm using my laptop, which is um, just over to the right of me, and so I'm able to kind of look over uh, and looking over a lot is important because that's where the information is. 
So I'm changing up the color here. I'm grabbing that kind of brighter um, pea green, pea as in peas that grow. And I'm just gonna bring that color across. And I'm gonna grab some of that kind of sap green that we made and I'm gonna just blend that right in while these two colors are wet. This is that moment of wet blending that is just so fun. And you don't want to over blend. This is the key here is to get to where you want it to be, that nice fade, and then leave it alone. So it's okay that some of this red has kind of accidentally come through. And this is a fun time to kind of just unload your brush. If you've got some pigment on there, you can just like push really hard, get that in there. And I can't forget this little spot of green just beyond the boathouse. This area has already dried, so I'm able to kind of come back and overcoat and just kind of make that a little richer. I'm going to grab our ochre that we made and underpaint this ochre color here in the, the bottom right. And I'm going to bring that all the way up to the, the shoreline, the little um, boat launch spot. And we talked about this being a warm yellow and this is exactly why we're, we've chosen the warm yellow so that some of these colors are just really deep and saturated and pull your eye closer and forward. While this is a little bit wet I'm going to grab a little bit of white and just kind of tint this down where I see kind of this like maybe burn patch over here I uh, just add a little bit of brush stroke variety. So there's going to be layers that go in on top of this to help create some of that um, a kind of burnt feel of the grass. And I'm grabbing some of our of our darkest value. And again, while this is wet, I'm just going to create a little fade here so that the core your eye kind of um, works towards the corners. To me both corners of this painting are a little darker and that could be the effect of the the older photograph too. Sometimes with the manual cameras uh, light would creep in or there would be a slight overexposure on the corners or the edges and I kind of like that effect. So all of the green that I painted now is either tacky or dry so you can really see how fast acrylic dries and how fast you have to work <laughs> if you want to get some of these blends. So going back into this area would only be for adding texture, not for blending. So right now I'm just adding a little bit of texture, taking whatever color is on my brush and just kind of popping it around here. This area is kind of tacky, so I'm not going to get the same kind of effect or the same kind of blending that I'm looking for. Uh, just as an example to show you what happens when you go back into a tacky area. Notice how I'm pulling the paint off. And it's just not blending or sitting well with the layer underneath. It's kind of, um, it's a little bit gummy and it's not a consistent um, kind of layering. So just something to be aware of, that you can accidentally pull paint that's trying to dry and adhere to the canvas right off onto your brush. Uh, and it can leave kind of a gap that can be hard to fill later. I'm going to switch up my brush uh, to the smaller one and I'm going to grab our watercolor and just making sure to remember to get in here with some of the, the lake color 
And I'm just going to go back into my lake and add in another layer. I'm going to dip right into the cerulean blue and kind of change this color up a bit. Um, I'm thinking about that kind of filter and I'm seeing how cool this water looks off in the, in the right hand corner. So I'm just making an on the fly decision, not a mixed color. I'm leaving a little bit of a bright edge to kind of give the illusion of a shoreline back there. I'm not so worried about coming up over the green right here because the grasses will be coming in and same over here. So that, that first layer of water had a chance to dry so this second layer is going on really nice. And just to kind of grab some of that original blue just to wet blend back in there. Kind of fade. And it's okay to go over the boathouse a little bit here. And making sure to come in across onto the left. And if you want that kind of the lines or the, the, the horizontal kind of effect of waves, then you want to make your brush strokes do that for you as well. So this part feels shallow and bright to me. So I'm even going to brighten that up by adding a little bit of white. And it feels pretty bright to me right here. I'm just going to add a little bit of white, straight white to my brush, bringing it across, making sure that my brush strokes kind of resemble the, the horizontal nature of the water. And then also here it feels a little shallow. So I'm trying to not necessarily finish, but feel really good about this middle ground before I go in and do the grasses and all of these things like the boathouse because I let my brush stroke go across the boathouse so that I could get a nice seamless edge. And we can kind of accentuate this shoreline, again using my little pinky as a, a peg leg. It's kind of coming back here, adding in the highlight. giving the illusion of maybe a, a beach or a little bit more of a shallow um, kind of water line. Let's see about getting our, our little, our little boathouse roughed in here. So we're going to go with straight white. We mixed kind of this cream color. But I'm not convinced it's the best. I want to chunk this guy in using vertical brush strokes now, kind of mimicking the slats in the wood. And the, the roof uh, is a little bit gray. I'm going to grab some of this ochre, I'm just mixing right on the brush, ochre and a little bit of this sort of gray tree line color. So this is where you get to kind of improvise and use the batches of color that you already made and find a little spot on your, on your palette knife or on your palette to, oh wait, we're doing the roof. Yeah, letting your brush strokes kind of follow the line of the architecture. And then grabbing some of the, the cooler blue from that background tree line, adding a little bit of white. This is going to be my shadow. Let's add a little bit of the dark, kind of gray it up a bit. So these are kind of one-off mixtures. You know, these aren't mixtures that I need a big batch of. These are mixtures that I need for a moment. And if we needed to remake them, we could. We've got all, this, all the ingredients are right there. So one thing I'm I'm immediately noticing is that the in my reference the shadow of the boathouse is quite a few shades darker than the water on the left. So let's see what happens when this dries and we might want to either lighten the water or darken the shadow. We've got what well, we have some options but just just so you know kind of how I'm thinking as I'm putting color down is I'm always kind of looking around that that space to see if the values are 
are supporting each other. Is there a light value next to a, a darker value so that I can actually see what's happening? So we can, we can now kind of add in some of our, just kind of suggest some of the boats here. Uh, we can also use our dark value to put in the swing if we're pretty happy. Um, I would wait on the swing actually until I'm feeling really good about the water and the, and the grasses. So I'm going to add in our shadow here for the boathouse. Uh, and it's pretty straight across and long. So whatever time of day it is, we've got these beautiful long shadows. I do remember spending a lot of time at these docks in the morning because that's when the crayfish were biting. And if you've ever gone crayfish hunting, the best bait is chicken bones. Chicken bones and a string, that's all you need. Uh, we never ate the crayfish. And they were just kind of fun to watch in buckets and catch, right? <laughs> so canoes have a very particular shape. So I'm trying to be very careful here in order to replicate that shape because it can be kind of hard to go back and correct when you're using these darker values. Uh, it's feeling a little dry. So I just grabbed a little bit of the medium as opposed to water. I don't want this to be at all drippy, but I want it to have a little bit more control over the brush. Um, you probably noticed me looking at my reference quite a bit because this is where the information is and that's how I'm going to get this right. This boat back here is just kind of, we're just seeing part of it. And there's the other part of it. So we've got two boats two canoes, sort of side by side. They probably live on the side of this boathouse, but they haven't been put away yet, so they're just lingering. It's so nice to see a dark value pop into your painting. Um, for me, it just sort of, it adds a, a point of contact for where all the other colors sit and can really help me determine what I need to tweak before we finalize things in the painting. And I would consider everything that I'm doing right now under painting, meaning we want to bring back more texture and more detail and more color. Um, but we're getting a coat of paint on most of our canvas. So if you think about starting your painting, think about getting a loose coat of paint on most of your canvas. Now I feel pretty happy about the water right here, so I'm just with a little flick of my brush, I'm creating these uh, grasses back here, or these reeds, and I'm literally just pushing and then lifting up, pushing and then lifting up. The paint brush is not too loaded up. Seems like there's quite a bit of shadow over here. There might be a couple of rowboats in the water, not exactly sure, but we've got these two little docks right here. I have to be honest, my sister asked me to paint this painting for her. It's, it's really kind of fun. You know, we all, my um, four, my four sibs, um, my three sibs and I, we just, we have so many memories at this place and um, this painting will be for Sarah. So I'm just going to green up this color a bit if you want to look over here. It's the dark pigment. I just kind of greened it up, just added some of that ochre green. And I'm going to do the same thing over here. So I'm just touching down with the brush and lifting quickly. Touching down with the brush and lifting quickly. And it just gives us like feathery effect. Now we can go back in and kind of parcel out some of these details with the liner brush later. Maybe even um, bring back a little highlight to kind of separate some of those. Kind of 
of straighten that out a bit. If you ever feel like your brush is getting just too clogged with paint and it's giving a different color than you had imagined, just use your rag, clean it off, start over. So we've got some nice details coming in here. I'm going to take this dark and underpaint some of our tree, just to get in some of the the essence of those of those branches. They're kind of um, moving upwards. And again, adding in this dark value just puts perspective on the painting. You can really start seeing where the focal point is developing. And there's kind of multiple focal points in this painting, which is kind of neat. And it's working really nicely on the rule of thirds. So one third of the way we have our boathouse. Another third of the way we have the canoes and the swing. Um, and then certainly not quite through the middle, but almost, you know, is a lot of the information. So we want to work the viewer's eye towards these items, towards these, these um, elements in the painting. And whether that's bringing in texture in through here so that your eye can lead towards them, the high contrast certainly is going to do that trick. Um, the clean, the kind of clean, clean lines and shapes over here versus maybe some, some um, more haptic or more movement oriented brush strokes uh, next to it. So this is where I really get to kind of invent the painting is after it's underpainted, I mean this is just um, a really fun time to kind of then go back in and play. Adding texture, being kind of expressive maybe a little bold uh, and don't forget to step back and stepping back can be literally just stepping back five feet ten feet if you can twenty feet thirty feet <laughs> because getting some distance really helps your eye blur some of the elements uh, and can pull things out that you weren't aware of when you were standing there just two feet away from your painting for multiple hours another good thing to do is to take a break, to put your brush down, maybe put a piece of saran wrap over your mixture, um, or you can use a little spray bottle to kind of just add a layer of mist to the top of your paints so they don't skin over. And then coming back with fresh eyes is just such a nice way to get perspective on where you're at with your painting. So after putting in these little details here, um, I would consider this painting underpainted. And I'm going to kind of speed up the process of the finishing of this painting. Um, I will probably spend another hour, maybe hour and a half, um, really working on the painting. And so I will um, speed that up for you so you can kind of see that all kind of come together. Just kind of taking my time, you know, building this almost like a puzzle. It's like putting all the pieces together and knowing that I can come back and correct things as needed. Before I move on um, to the kind of sped up portion of this demo, I'm going to use a matte medium and I'm going to do a little glazing for you. So I've got quite a bit of matte medium, uh, a little bit of this blue gray, which I'm going to clean off my brush. That's not the color I wanted. Um, I'm going to go in and I want to glaze over some of the grass. So glazing is adding um, quite a bit of this medium, not water. It's going to allow the paint to be really translucent. And this is where I'm going to start kind of playing around with texture. And it's allowing some of that bright green to come through, which is really fun. But it's adding a little bit of texture to show some of the grasses um, that are there, a little burned. And can you see that just lovely subtle layering? 
That's probably what I'll do for most of this foreground is work with glazes. Um, so you'll see, you'll see the painting be developed, but just so you know, um, I'm going to be using the matte medium. I'm going to be kind of moving the brush around um, to make different kinds of marks to create this illusion of, of texture. And I'll probably make uh, a couple more greens. I'm feeling like I'm lacking like a dark, rich green. Uh, so you can see here the second layer of paint b back here just adds another level of vibrancy. So it was nice to get the boats in because now if I need to make any subtle corrections to the boats, I can. So see now adding this bright green on top, uh, bright green meaning it has just a little bit more white value. You can really start to see that kind of punch out and pop in. We gotta add a little bit of green back here. So I've really enjoyed getting this painting started with you, um, you know, where you dream of going and what you'll be um, exploring with your, with your materials. And I'm certainly here for you if you have any questions and I look forward to seeing you in the virtual portion of our class. And I really just wish you um, happy painting. <laughs>